Is it possible that autoimmune responses could be triggered by the spike protein from infection and the elephant in the room? These are big topics, these are important topics, and they are very relevant because they have an implication to population health. Some people may consider this inappropriate to even ask the question, but what we're doing today is looking at the research and the extrapolation of the research. If you've been following me for a while, you'll understand that we're not just looking at a snapshot, but we're learning how to look beyond what we see now in preparation for what is to come next. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. I'm a clinical researcher and physician. I've been focused on COVID-19 since 2020, focused on autoimmune responses, and I've developed multiple programs and books to help you guide you through this whole process. So the reason I'm talking more about this is again to highlight one of those presentations coming up in just a few days, Autoimmunity 101, the body's mysterious attack on itself. And the reason I'm doing this is because so many people don't quite understand about autoimmunity and they don't get how serious and significant this is. What's critical is that I believe that if we understand this, if we acknowledge it, if we face it, we can mitigate it. And that's the point that I'm trying to do. We can mitigate this. So it doesn't matter what your situation is. Let's focus on what we can do to overcome the situation. So let's start with a few basic things. One of the issues is that autoimmunity is not quick. And so therefore, many studies are only looking at the short term, at longest, the medium term, if they're actually studying it. And it's this problem that causes people to underestimate it because they say, well, if it was an issue, we would have seen it already. It doesn't quite work like that. Here is some information from Johns Hopkins. And so Johns Hopkins, this is autoimmunity basics. And what they were looking at here is one good example of an autoimmune disease is type 1 diabetes, where the immune system is targeting the beta islet cells in the pancreas and destroying them. And what they highlighted here is that if you had 100% of your cells, say at the age of 20, then there was a trigger. This is the age of 20, whatever that was, it could have been a viral infection. And you have some genetic susceptibility. What then happens is that your beta cells start to be destroyed. But there's a timeline here. So the immune dysregulation is occurring all along but you don't start to see symptoms until all the way down here. And that could be three years after the initial trigger and the autoimmune response. That's the problem with autoimmunity. It isn't necessarily very quick and it's very subtle. So what do people do? Is it even real? Well, let me tell you what the statistics show. What you will actually be told if you ask the um, the system, they will say, no, I am just fear mongering. I'm just making up stuff. This is not actually accurate. Based on the evidence, there are no problems. Again, they are looking too short term. So I'm going to show you two papers here. This is what I'll be covering as well in the presentation in more detail. But let's look at one of these papers here. This one was published in July of 2024. And they were looking at the long-term risk of autoimmune disease after mRNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccination in a Korean nationwide-based population study. And they're doing this because this question is a very important question. So it's not that they're just randomly doing it. People like me have been pushing and pressing this button about autoimmunity. And so they thought, well, why don't we look at it? And so this is exactly what they did. So they then looked at, with regards to mRNA, they were looking at a population-based cohort study involving over 9 million people. And they were trying to decide about the incidence of autoimmune conditions associated with the mRNA vaccination. And this study spanned over a year of observation. So it's a big study over a long period of time, and it could give some valuable results. But remember what I told you about autoimmunity. As I said, it doesn't appear quickly. 
And so you have to know what to look for. And more critically, you have to look at trends, not necessarily specifically disease, but even within that, that gives us some valuable information. So let's look at what they found from looking at these trends here. So as I said, they are looking at the long-term autoimmune diseases. I've highlighted this bit here because they found that a boost of vaccination was associated with an increased risk of some autoimmune conditions here, uh, connective tissue um, diseases, including alopecia areata, psoriasis, and rheumatoid arthritis. However, it goes on to say, we conclude that mRNA vaccinations are not associated with an increased risk of most autoimmune connective tissue diseases, although further research is needed regarding its potential association with certain conditions. So this is what the big study is showing us. So you may think to yourself, well, oh, that's pretty good news. It doesn't show any relevant, significant findings. Again, I say you have to learn to look beyond the superficial. Let's look a little bit more detail as to exactly what they found in the paper. So when we look here, this is what, this is alopecia areata, this hair loss. In red is mRNA vaccination. It's blue, it's controls. When something doesn't have an effect, this is what I expect to see. Red and blue are together. I mean, at the end here, you see a little change, but nothing much. In this one, in this form of alopecia, it seems that you had less of it compared to the controls. Similarly with psoriasis, vitiligo is a little bit closer together, but you can see, look at Bechet's disease here. Now, what that indicates is that vaccination is clearly having an impact on the immune system. So in these conditions, it seems to be reducing the risk. But you have to remember, as I said, that if it causes a change one way, you're going to get a rebound effect. And so this is a really important point that if you are seeing a reduction in certain autoimmune conditions, it suggests there is a mechanism, and it could be something like IgG4, which is immune suppressive, that is impacting the presentation of disease. You may say, oh, well, that's great news. No, it's not. Because when the IgG4 antibodies disappear, you're going to get a rebound. And that rebound is going to cause an increased presentation of disease. Now, they did have some conditions that had a higher risk um, based on here. You can see bullous pemphigoid. And um, this is one of the ones that had a significantly higher risk in terms of vaccination. And we know the other big ones that we had uh, covered, and you can probably see it here. I'm trying to see if I can make this picture big enough for you to be able to see it. And in this image here from the paper, they're talking about the age groups less than 40, greater than 40, male versus female. And then you have this line down the middle, which represents no change. So if it's on this line, then there's no significant change. And if you go across here, they didn't find any change with males with ulcerative colitis or with women, that kind of thing. Where it's red, it's standing out as being a significant increased risk. And for this here, we know myocarditis, pericarditis, Guillain-Barre syndrome. These are some of the big ones that have a significant observed increased autoimmune risk, as as well we had mentioned bullous pemphigoid. And what we then indicate is that, yes, it does seem that the vaccination has an impact on autoimmune diseases, in that in some conditions it increases the risk, and in others, it seems to reduce the risk, but after one year, remember the principle, autoimmune diseases takes years to develop. So therefore, what we could then see is a rebound phenomena, which will appear later on. Now, some of the critics may say, oh, 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 it doesn't matter. You have no evidence that it means that this is going to happen. Okay, now I'm going to show you the most important paper, which very few people are aware of. And this paper was fascinating. I had to go looking for this. That's how hidden this was. 
This was a really important study looking at the prediction of autoantibodies in healthcare workers after mRNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. It was a single center prospective follow-up. It wasn't a big study, study. It was done in Italy, but they did what should have been done. Essentially, they started off single center follow-up study evaluating whether or not their healthcare workers who were vaccinated um, with the two mRNA vaccines will show a development and or a persistence of autoantibodies. Now, this is the kind of research that should have been done. In effect, they were looking for problems. This is how it works. You have to understand that when it comes to a new drug, a new technology, our responsibility is not to go, yay, this is wonderful. No, no, no. What you want to do is look carefully. You need to challenge the science, push the science, make sure that you advocate to make sure that it is actually safe for the public. There is no harm. If it is, then the questions don't matter too much. So this study in Italy was the template of what should have been done, where they started from time zero, they took the measurements of their autoantibodies, if they had any at all, then they measured it at three months, then they measured it at 12 months. They did this over a 12-month period, and this was the perfect kind of study. The problem that the detractors will have is that they don't have an equivalent study that says anything different. Here is what they found when they looked at it. And this is just from the information that they have. So after, so our research suggests that mRNA-based SARS-CoV-2 vaccines can induce the production of de novo, which means new autoantibodies, ANA, anti-nuclear antibodies, in 28.5% of subjects. That is absolutely remarkable. 28.5% of their subjects had new onset autoantibodies. And this is, and what they found as well is that for patients who already had autoantibodies, they had an increase after over 12 months. So this kind of study gives you what I'm talking about in terms of trends. Remember, this is how Johns Hopkins, I'll show you again. This is how autoimmune diseases work. There is a trigger. The autoantibodies don't mean that you have an autoimmune disease. It's a trend. And what can happen is if these autoantibodies continue to be produced over a period of time, it may take three years, five years, then people start to have presentation. This is now clinical diabetes. This could be five years down the line from the environmental trigger. So what we're seeing here is that the environmental trigger is causing a trend towards autoimmunity. This is why it's so important. And what I'm trying to do when I speak about autoimmunity 101, this is why I'm encouraging people to come and watch this because I am thinking carefully about what are the manifestations of disease that we can look out for. Who is at risk? Is there any way that we can mitigate it? And I'm going to be trying to use it in a story, not a quite a story format, but I'm, I'm having to find multiple types of analogies to help people to understand this concept of the immune system attacking itself. And primarily, I think I'm going to use the police force. If the police force who are here to serve and protect suddenly start attacking and hurting the citizens, that's a typical parallel to autoimmunity, and it could cause great damage. And this is where we are now. We have already done the deed. Billions of people have been vaccinated. And so this is no longer about whether or not this is interfering with the narrative. This is now about, okay, we've done this. What are the implications? What can we do? How do we manage this? What if this is a problem? If it isn't a problem, wonderful. But if it is, we need to know and we need to try and mitigate it. So thank you all very much for watching. And as I said, 
we'll continue to bring you up to date challenging science as we continue through this process. Hey, her important point coming up in just a few days is my interview where I'm going to be interviewed by Steve Kirsch. Um, this is on Thursday, the 16th of January, 7 p.m. ET. It's going live on Rumble and X, vaxsafety.org. Please follow along um, there. I normally do the interviews, so it's unusual for me to be given the mic to be interviewed. And so I really appreciate the support. And in those times, I usually get a chance to explain some of the concepts that I've been looking at over this time, especially predicting where disease is going based on the autoimmune paradigm. Look out for that as well. And as usual, have a great evening until we meet again.